Okay, good evening. Um, here we go. We're continuing in the book of Exodus. Um, I'm actually very excited about this class because I think it's going to pull together a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about over the last um, couple of weeks um, in the book of Exodus. So this week's Torah portion is called Parshat Bo. And um, if you remember, last week we spoke about the seven of the ten plagues. So we started with seven, the seven of the ten plagues. We're in last week's Torah portion. And we are now at the uh, culmination, the end, the last three. And um, actually, the way they're often um, grouped is they're grouped in, in, in blocks of three. So we had last week seven. This week we have the last three. Um, and they are the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, and then the plague of the death of the firstborn, of the Egyptian firstborn. Um, and I think one of the things, as I've been reading and as I've been learning, one of the central themes about these three plagues and what it is that we're enjoying to learn about it is this um, notion of darkness. When the, so I'm going to start at the very beginning and I want to weave in this idea of darkness and then coming into the light and what that means. So obviously it's a Hanukkah theme, but it's a Pesach theme. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Pesach. This is the exodus from Egypt and its culmination. The holiday of Passover is given to us in this week's Torah portion, the, the mitzvah, the obligation that we have as Jewish people to tell this story, to know who we are, to know where we came from, is all written out in this week's Torah portion. So there's a huge amount of material here. I'm not going to cover even a minute part of it, but let's dive in. God says to Moses, come to Pharaoh, Bo, that's the word, that's your, as we have spoken before many times, the name of the Pasha is um, pulled out from a word in the, one of the first, of the second of the uh, sentences at the beginning of the Torah portion, so it says, come to Pharaoh, Bo, it says, Bo el Paro, for I have made his heart and the heart of his serpents stubborn, so that I can put these signs of mine in his midst so that you may relate in the ears of your son and your son's son that I made a mockery of Egypt and my signs that I placed upon them, that you may know that I am Hashem. Um, so there's a lot to talk about here. Bo, come to Pharaoh. Why does it say, why does it say go to Pharaoh? Like this language of Bo is because, as we probably all know, uh, we've spoken about it many, many times before, the, uh, the faith that we have and the understanding that we have that God is with us and that Moses is being told, I want, by God, I'm coming with you. Come with me. Together we're going to face Pharaoh. Pharaoh who thinks of himself as a God. Pharaoh who is, you know, filled with his own egocentricity, who is arrogant beyond any other person. You know, he's just so full of himself. He so um, considers himself to be a deity. Uh, and the, um, he encapsulates evil in the world. God's saying to Moses, I want you to go, but I'm coming with you. So it's, the language is come, so that we learn from that, the idea that that God's with us all the time. So it's not go, go from me, go away from me. No, it's, no I'm coming with you. This is something we're going to do together. You, Moses and Aaron, are my mouthpiece. This is something that I'm doing. I'm bringing the nation of the Jewish people, the Bnei Yisrael, I'm bringing them out of Egypt. This is going to be done with no merit until we learn about it in this week's Torah portion, but up until now, the, the uh, Jewish people are completely passive. It's happening, you know, all around them. All these plagues are coming, the seven plagues that we read about last week. Seven plagues are coming, and the Jewish people have done nothing. Um, they're watching, they're learning, they're seeing, they're, they're becoming softened by this God that is afflicting their oppressors, their Egyptians are being afflicted, you know, time after time after time. And they are being spared of this, so they're aware that there's something different about them, that God is, uh, is sparing them from these plagues, and it's happening to the Egyptians. The people that are oppressing them are being, are being um, affected by these plague after plague after plague. So come, come with me. I'm here. I'm with you. I'm coming with you, says God to Moses and Aaron when they go to face Pharaoh again. So now the next plague's being, being um, told and it's and it's this language again of God hardening the heart of Pharaoh again we spoke about it last week brief recapitulation of that which is that in order for Pharaoh to have free will his heart heart had to be hardened so that his intellect could make decisions if he's affected by the plague so much that he's so scared of God that he's like fine do whatever you want because I'm so scared then it's not coming from a place of free will. He's coerced into letting the Jewish people go because of the because of the oppressive nature of each of these plagues. So God's in, on some level is sort of leveling the playing field, pulling pulling giving giving 
Pharaoh a certain amount of courage in his heart so that he can resist um, the fear of the plague in order to then choose to say, no, I'm not letting the Jewish people go. Like, like I'm still, I'm still the God. I'm still in charge. This is still my people. I have a right to oppress these people. Who is this God? I don't know this God. Go away. Doesn't, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't, um, it's not going to change my, 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 my mind, right? The plague's not going to change my mind because I have a hard heart, right? So, so, and the other thing we learn out of this with God hardening the heart of Pharaoh, especially in these last plagues, is the notion that up until now there's been a sort of like a strengthening of the heart and now it's a cupboard, it's a more of a uh, hardening such that these plagues are going to reach their culmination. And we'll talk a little bit about why there had to be 10 plagues. But uh, what, what God is manifesting, what he's educating, not just the Egyptians, but now even more so the Jewish people, what we all need to bear in mind, and as you know, there are so many places in our day, in our lives, where we remember the going out of Egypt and the Shema. We talk about going out of Egypt in our morning, in our prayer, daily prayers. We talk about going out of Egypt. On our mezuzahs, we talk about going out of Egypt. It is a daily memory of ours. It's a daily um, kind of a, like reminding ourselves who we are, where God is in our lives, that God is that God is in our lives, that God is part and parcel of our experience all the time, and that God is with us all the time, just like he was back then, just like God brought these 10 plagues into the world, and he suspended nature, he created nature, but he didn't leave it like the watchmaker, you know, wind up the watch and let it run on its own, that he's involved and and part and parcel of the way in which his world continues is God's involvement, continues to be involved, continues to be able to affect the world. So so just to recap, just to recap a little bit, so Moses and Aaron are going with God. So God's saying, come with me, I'm going, well, let's go, we're, gonna, we're going to go to the Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart, I'm hardening because these plagues have to be ones that he can choose to resist and kind of affect him so much that he's choosing not to resist, that he's you know, affected by the plague such that he'll let them go out of fear. So we're going to make him so that he's not fearful of the plague so that he can choose to continue to enslave the Jewish people. And, um, and, 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 and the whole point of these plagues, a lot of points of these plagues, one of the points of these plagues is to teach us, us, everybody, the whole world, all of creation, that God, I am Hashem, I am Hashem, I am Hashem, who is Hashem? One God, one creator, one sustainer, one controller, one one God that is involved in everything with within whom we all exist, right? So our existence is dependent on God's existence, not the other way around, right? We don't create God. God creates us. We are in in him, so to speak. We are as if we are a, a a baby in the womb, so to speak, of godliness that exists all around the oneness of God. So, mo so, so God is hardening Pharaoh's heart such that he can, again, he can resist the plagues, but also because this is how he has been all along, even when God didn't harden his heart, Pharaoh had this inability, this denial, whatever it was, that he was unable to crack open his heart and to see the reality of, of God, of the oneness of I am Hashem, Yud and Ahay and Avav and Hay, the God that was, that was and will be, we talked about last week. He's unable to see that and we learn out from this that the way in which we go is the way God helps us. If we want to resist God, if we don't want to know God, if we want to push God away, God will help us do that. If we're seeking and we're searching and we're looking and we want to find God and we're sincere, God will help us. So there is, an, um, there is a teaching, a Jewish teaching, that in the way we wish to go, God will help us. So that's something to learn for our, for our lives. Like how, what's our path? What are we looking to do? What are we yearning for? What are we searching for? And those things that we search for, God thinks that God will help us. Here's Pharaoh, who's obviously pushing God away, doesn't want to know God, doesn't want to be doesn't want to be affected by God, wants to be better than God or bigger than God or whatever it is that he wants. God's help there. Moses, excuse me, God, our God, the God, is helping him do that and continuing to allow him to resist. Um, helping him go in the way which in which he wants to go. So what is Mo, what are Moses and, Fe, and uh, Aaron asking? They're asking to let the Jewish people go, right? We know that from the, let my people go, and obviously we know that Pharaoh says no, I'm not going to let them go. And but what is it that Moses asked for? Well, he asked that we could go celebrate. We want to go celebrate with God. This is a novel concept. The deities that existed in 
Egypt, the idols, the sun, the, the river Nile, you know, they were sort of constructs that served the, the people, right? If I want my God to do something for me, then I kind of, you know, bring my, I don't really know much about it, but this is how I imagine it, that they would bring their sacrifices or they would do their whatever, their efforts, and then and then the God of the sun would, would uh, whatever, or the God of the rain would send the rain or the God of whatever. So there was a sense that, that, that the person, by bringing their sacrifices and doing their efforts for the God, could make the God do things for them. So we're going to, you know, and so they had to, you know, on some level they're serving these gods, right? Here's a novel concept. Moses and Aaron are coming to Pharaoh and saying, we want to celebrate. We want to go out into the desert. We want to take our children. We want to take our wives. We want to take everybody, the, 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 the flocks, the, the herds, everything, all, all of us, our whole community, we're going to go out and celebrate. We're going to rejoice. We're going to have a party. We're going to be joyous with our God. This is a novel concept to have a God, the God, with, with whom we have a relationship, with whom we celebrate with, like our Jewish holidays, most of them are, excuse me, holy days, holy holidays, but they're also festivals. They're also ones where we, we are enjoined to rejoice. Many of our holidays, we're rejoicing. We're, we're looking to be in relationship and to partnership with something that's so infinite and so full of life and goodness and truth and all of that. So when we attach ourselves to that, it brings joy to our hearts, to our souls. And so our service of God isn't doom and gloom and get what I want. It's a, a joining with the divine such that we elevate ourselves, such that we become holy and happy and fulfilled and live meaningful lives and all of that. So this concept of Moses saying to Pharaoh, I want, I'm not just taking the men, it's not just the men who are going to go, quote, serve God and bring whatever they're going to do, but we want the whole community to go out. We want the children to go out. We want the wives to go out. You know, we want everyone. And Pharaoh saying, well, you know, well, I, you know I don't, I don't, I, that, that's too much, you know, just send the men. No, we're not going to just send the men, right? We need the women also. And we need the children also. So again, here's teaching us, teaching us that we, the Jewish people, are all of us, it's not just the rabbis or the people who are the leaders. Like every single one of us is a piece in the puzzle of the Jewish people. And every one of us has an, is an important and a unique configuration of gifts and talents that is necessary to be part of the whole puzzle of the Jewish people. So when Pharaoh is saying, just send the men, Moses is saying, no, 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 no. That's not the way the Jewish people work. The Jewish people work is everybody. We're all people. So I think we could really bring this into our lives where... Perhaps there's a sense that, you know, some people are more important than others. Or, um, again, I, this is something I, I really think we need to do better in in our Jewish communities here right now in the, 20, in the year 2020 is that we have to do better with the people who feel marginalized, the people who don't, who don't fit the model, the people who aren't in the, you know, the, the bell curve, the people who are on the edges, the people who are single, the people who don't have children, the people who are gay, the people who are, like all of these people who don't feel like they have so much part of the community. It's our job to make sure that they are. And maybe we can learn that from this teaching where Moses is saying, no, I'm not just, we're not just interested in the men going and serving. We're looking for everybody, all the people, the old people, the young people, the wives, the, the, the women and the men, everybody, everybody's going out and our cattle, our cattle is going out. And it says in the Torah, says in this week's Torah portion, because the cattle, like they're almost leading, they want to go. They have a, a sense that they want to sacrifice themselves for God. Um, meaning, um, and, and Moses says, you know, I, we don't know till we get to the, till we get there, till we get to the desert, let's say, what was there is, we won't, he says to Pharaoh, we're taking the cattle because we won't know till we get there what kinds of, what kinds of ways in which we will serve our God. We don't know what that's going to look like. So we have to take our cattle with us because we don't know how to serve God till we get there. And some of the mystics say that the there is till we get to the next world. We don't really know. Like we're doing our best, struggling in the darkness to know how to live our lives, you know. But And we have a lot of light that comes out of our teachings and out of our Torah and out of our, you know, wise people and our, and et cetera, et cetera. But until we get there, till we get to the land of tr the land, until we get to the, uh, to the world of truth, the next world, we won't really know till we get there what the you know, what most important things were down here. So we're like still a little bit in the dark. Darkness, I think, is the theme of this week's Torah portion. So there's going to be, in this week's Torah portion, there's going to be the last three of the 10 plagues. So I want to talk about why there's 10 plagues. 
So if you go back to Genesis, when God created the world, he created the world with 10 mamoros, with 10 utterances, with 10, um, you, know, you know, let there be light. God spoke the world into existence. And it's so interesting. I don't know, I have an Alexa and you can talk to the Alexa and it talks back at you or it plays the music that you want or it does things, you know, and it's so interesting. But here's our modern technology as a way to understand how language, how our speech can create a reality. When I say something, that machine does something. Okay, so it's it's very, you know, programmed or whatever, but it gives us an idea of what it might mean on some, you know, little level or, you know, sort of push it, push it out a little bit, how it is that when God spoke, the world was created through the speech of God, through the mamoro, through the, the word is amar, like God spoke, like what did he, what did he create? He created the world, right? And he created the world with all the laws of nature. And we went through the creation of the world in these 10 utterances with which God created the world. Now, here we are in the book of Exodus, and we have 10 plagues. And it's not coincidental as 10 plagues and there's 10 utterances with which God created the world the 10 plagues what the 10 plagues do is that they show how God is behind nature right so God und so to speak undid nature he's he's in control of nature and he's showing how he's in control of nature now he didn't again didn't just set it into motion back in Genesis back in the creation of the world but he's still involved in it now and he can he can he can undo it he can you know manipulate it it can be whatever he, whatever it, whatever it's going to be you know it can it can it can um it doesn't have to hold to those laws of nature if it's the will of God to change the laws of nature which is God showing that through the 10 plagues and there's um there's uh there's commentaries that show how each way in which God created the world matches up with one of the 10 plagues so for instance God created light and our ninth plague is the plague of darkness God created man on the the last Creation was mankind, and God destroyed the firstborn. So we have this idea, like we can match up each plague with each act of creation, with that speech of creation. So the plagues are God in control, God from coming from God, undoing the nature, showing that God's behind nature, and can be very precise and can be very focused, etc., etc., and then when we come out of Egypt, the Jewish people, and we go to the Mount Sinai, we get the commandments. How many commands? We get 10 commandments, which in Hebrew is Aseret Adibro. We have 10, again, Dibor, like speech of that different word than Mamaros of Amar, which is what is being created. We now have the Dibro, the 10 um, commandments. God speaks out the 10 commandments, which is now a relationship. God is bringing out the these people that started off as a family that came down, that came down from uh, from from Israel down to from Canaan down to Egypt, and as we know, you know the Pharaoh came, blah blah blah, and now we're here, and this is the this is the nation that came from that family that came, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, and uh, they were oppressed and blah blah blah. And um, now they're going to become a, a people. We're, come, we're, we're becoming a nation in this week's Torah portion. We're coming out of Egypt as a people, as a nation, into the light, so to speak. We're going to be brought to Mount Sinai where we're going to receive the Ten Commandments, the Aseris Adibros. And this is the Debo. Now we have a relationship. What God is doing is saying, this is my firstborn nation. When the Jewish people are, are, are coined the term in the Torah is that we're the firstborn nation. We'll talk about that. And what it means to be the firstborn nation and what it means that we are in relationship to God uh, through these 10 um, commandments, right? So this is how we're supposed to live our lives. These are the laws that govern our lives. So God created the people, brought the people out and gave us 10 commandments of how to live our lives. So we went from 10 ways in which the world was created, laws of nature. We un God showed he's behind that and now he's giving us 10 uh, commandments of how to live our lives and what that means to live in relationship to God in this world, to connect to that light. The plague of locusts was the first plague in this week's Torah portion. And when the locusts came, it was like darkness descended upon the land. It uses the word darkness. I'm not going to dwell on the on that on that plague. I want to move to the plague of um, of darkness because I think it's a very cool plague. 
So God says to Moses, here I'm reading it out of the out of the Torah, stretch forth your hand towards the heavens, and there shall be a darkness upon the land of Egypt, and the darkness will be tangible. Moses stretched forth his hand towards the heavens, and there was a thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for a three-day period. No man could see his brother, nor could anyone rise from his place for a three-day period. But for all the children of Israel, there was light in their dwellings. Amazing, amazing, amazing ideas. Um, here's a few of them. The darkness that the Egyptians suffered from was a two-tiered darkness. There was a three-day period and then another three-day period. So the first three days they couldn't see. The third, the second three days they were literally sort of stuck like a thick fog, you know, like London fog where you li literally couldn't move. Um, but the more mystical understanding of what the darkness meant is that the darkness was um, a sort of lack of clarity, was a was a, an uh, egocentric, arrogant um, inability to see other people, the obliviousness to the experience of another. When you when you're so into yourself, like Pharaoh was so into himself, he couldn't see other people. Other people were were not even in his consciousness. They were he was blind to them. And so this language of darkness descending upon the Egyptians is um, is directly corresponds to the Egyptians' inability to see the suffering of the Jewish people, that they were so into themselves and so egocentric and arrogant and harsh and cruel and so on and so on, that they uh, were blinded um, to the others. And that, that that's the darkness. So they their darkness was equivalent to their inability to see other people, to understand other people, to have compassion for other people, mercy on other people. They were so self-centered. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is they were so uh, seeking their own their own um, wealth, or they were they were like on a treadmill of like um, gaining and 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 maybe in our world it's sort of like the whatever it is that we that we serve. Like we want more, we want more money, we want more whatever. I don't know, I don't know. I don't want more cars, but you know you want more things, and you're running and running and doing and getting and getting and getting, and so you don't have time. We talked about this before, but for the Egyptians also that they didn't have um, an ability to to uh, to stop. Right. They were very self-centered and always grabbing and always wanting things and getting things. And it's me and me and me. And again, and not being able to again, maybe that's part of the same idea, but the selfish um, acquisition of things and stuff and just pursuant of that. Like there's no there's no your blinkers are so focused on trying to acquire things that you don't see outside. You don't see beyond that. So that kind of darkness that descended um, during the plague of darkness, says the Medrash four-fifths of the Jewish people died, which is an incredible number of people. Only one-fifth of the Jewish people actually left Egypt. Uh, four-fifths, apparently, says one Medrash, died during the plague of darkness when the, the Egyptians couldn't see the Jewish people dying. That wouldn't be a good thing for them to see, uh, that God's killing the, the, the Jewish people also. But those were the people who um, despaired. They were the people who didn't have any hope. They are the people who didn't want to leave. They were the people who didn't see, uh, didn't, 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 or by this point couldn't desire and search for God, right? So we talked before about um, desire and what is it you learn for and uh, yearn for and God helps you in the way you're going to go. Well, four-fifths of the uh, Jewish people apparently at this point didn't want to and couldn't search for God or had no hope that they were going to be redeemed, were like stuck. And those were the people that didn't make it out and they're the people that died during the plague of darkness. The lesson perhaps for our days is to, on some level, Passover is a holiday of faith and a, a holiday of um, faithfulness to an understanding, to an appreciation that God is alive and well and helping us and part of our experience. And we're, we might not see it. We might have times where it seems so dark to us, but to know it and to search for it and to look for it and to yearn for it, that's part of what our, we are enjoined to work on in this lifetime and if we do god will help us but these four fifths of the jewish people who didn't make it out were people who lost all hope they had no dreams for a better future they um, were imprisoned in their slavery and in their in their inability to see anything beyond where they were now um, in this week's torah portion we also learn that the first mitzvah in the torah is given to the jewish people and it's the mitzvah of the new moon to sanctify the new moon, to recognize the new moon, to look up and see there's the new moon, like this little sliver of the moon that is 
the way in which we count time, right? The Jewish people count time via the moon. We have a lunar cycle. We also have a solar cycle. Like every seven days is Shabbat. It's the Sabbath. We go by the sun, but we also go by the moon. The Jewish months are um, are learned out, are learned out, are um, are fixed by the moon, the cycle of the moon, the waxing, the waning of the moon goes really, really small and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then it's full and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and then it gets bigger and bigger. Again, we have this waxing and waning of the moon and we get, that God says to you, the Jewish people, to us, you get to, dis- to, to, to declare the moon. We send witnesses, they go and they see that the moon and they come back and they tell us that the moon, the moon is just this little sliver. And that's what we get to, um, through the witnesses, declare when the new moon is. And therefore we get to declare when our Jewish holidays are and we become partners with God. The first mitzvah, the first commandment in the Torah is for us to declare the new moon. We get to declare the new moon. God says, I want you people, the Jewish people, to be in charge of your time. You're no longer slaves. Once we're out of Egypt, you're no longer a slave. You're not a slave to Pharaoh. You are in control of your own time and you get to sanctify it. You get to declare when the new moon is and therefore you declare when all the holidays are going to be, when the Passover holiday is going to be. And we'll learn about that in a minute. Uh, But that's in our domain. So God is taking us out of Egypt, taking us out from slavery. And the first thing he says is, here's your partnership with me the first partnership you get is to declare time and to use time well and to sanctify time and to elevate time that's for us to do it's crazy it was amazing anyway another idea of this darkness so we know the egyptians experienced darkness so whether it was a darkness of their own egocentricity their own arrogance they were unable to see anybody else and to have anybody else in impact their themselves of selves and their and their importance etc um, another way to understand this dark, this darkness or the lightness that the Jewish people had, right? So the Egyptians had darkness. They were oblivious to God. They were oblivious to truth. They were in their own world doing their own thing. And the Jewish people had light. So what light did we have? Where did that light come from? Was it the light of the sun? And uh, what we uh, one of the one of the lovely teachings I I heard is that what the Jewish people had was this hidden light. The hidden light that God created on the very beginning of creation when he created light, not the sun, because that was later, that was, I think it was day five, I think. Um, But it was a light that was created that was a spiritual light that allowed you to see from one side of the universe to the other. It was a, it was a, it was a light that came from a high spiritual place that was a light that could, could shine out, that could, um, give you clarity and give you a sense of truth, what the truth is. And and that's the light that the Jewish people had access to. And when God says to Moses, stretch up your hands towards the heavens, one way of understanding that is that what Moses is doing is bringing down that light from the very high heavens. That light that's up in the heavens is coming down into this world, right? So there's what's going on up above and then what's going on down below. We're down below. What's coming from the high heavens is this light. And the Jewish people who were able and wanted to, back to our intention, where want to have a relationship with God and want to get there, we are able to use that light to see. But the, again, the Jewish people who didn't weren't, and they they uh, they were killed. And they were killed during this dark time. But the people who were, had access to this light had access to the light, this light. And I think another way to, I heard this really great thought. But with the um, the Egyptians, when this light came down from the high high heavens, it was like a piercing bright light. And the Egyptians who were so blocked, it was almost like, you know how you go to a movie theater or you go into a, there's an amazing museum in Israel for blind, it's called the Blind Museum, where you get to experience what it must be like to be blind. And you go into these rooms and it's pitch black and you're sort of struggling along and you're trying to figure out where things are. And you have somebody who's literally, is actually blind, who helps you to navigate through these different rooms and different experiences that you have. It's a very interesting museum, but it gives you a sense of what it must be to be literally in the dark and not be able to see anything. But the point I want to bring out, I recommend the museum, but the point I want to bring out is that when you come out of the of these various rooms, you've been in there maybe 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, I don't know, can't remember, but you come out 
and now you're in the sun and it's like blinding the, you know, the literally you can't you know you know how that feeling when you, you you come out from a dark place into the light and it's like blinding because it's 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 a shock to your system to be from a dark place into the light place so too these egyptians who are literally in their imprisoned darkness in this pitch blackness of of not being able to see god not wanting to see god um when that light comes down from the high heavens they're blinded by it so it wasn't darkness it was just their inability to see this light or attach themselves or connect to it that was like being blinded from the dark place that they couldn't see that they were immobilized by this by this brightness of the light that Moses was bringing down I think that's a cool way to think about it and that the Jews who were looking for it and wanted it and wanted to connect to God and are beginning through this process of all these plagues you know we're up to the ninth plague by the time we get to darkness that they're, they're they've softened them up and they're ready and they want to have a connection to God and they're and they're moving through like as a gradual change of understanding I am Hashem you know who this Hashem is and how it is that they're going to be in relationship to it and what it means for them etc so it's it's really amazing so um so here's Moses literally bringing down the light, bringing down the light into the world. And then the people who were able to access it and, and wanted to connect to it could. Um, and that what's coming down is spirituality. What's coming down is Shekhinah, is the divine, the divine presence is coming down. So I think that's a pretty good way of understanding the plague of darkness. The next plague is the plague of the death of the firstborn. And, um, and, and it, and it's, and it's, obviously very very intense and and this is the it says in the medrash that all the firstborn of the egyptians died not just not just uh the humans but the animals also and um it, it, it the medrash goes on and on with great detail as to who died in the plague of the firstborn it was all, it was uh it was it created so much grief and 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 a gr outcry it says it was an outcry that that would that would never ever happen again it would be beyond um i can't i can't find it right now but um that the that the um that the cries that would come from the egyptians would be so piercing and so pervasive there would never be anything like that again i just can't even imagine um and it says that pharaoh arose in the middle of the night right we probably all know that from a song but the idea that he was able to sleep, that he slept that night, even though he knew he was warned, Pharaoh um, was warned by Moses and Aaron that there was going to be the plague of the firstborn and he was able to sleep. However, that is possible. He was able to sleep um, somehow denying that there's such a God. He, again, mired in his own egocentricity and his own arrogance and his own sense of that he's the God and he's greater than this Yud and Nehe and Avav and Nehe and I'm Hashem, even though we've had these nine plagues um, preceding this last plague, that somehow he's able to sleep. And he sends Pharaoh and, um, excuse me, Pharaoh sends uh, Moses and Aaron away, don't want to see you again. And when the plague comes, the Medrash says that he's running, he's running to find Moses and Aaron. He wants to find them. Where are you? And he goes to Goshen where they're living and he's knocking on the doors. And like there's a crazy image of this Pharaoh character person epitome of evil epitome of self-arrogance going and looking for like begging on the doors knocking on the doors to find to find uh moses and aaron and obviously moses and aaron inside their house because now god is saying what i want you jews to do the last thing you're going to do before you leave um before you leave egypt is you're going to take the lamb or goat and you're going to that's the considered the deity the one of the gods of the egyptians and again the jewish people have to even though they've been living there for so many years and that they have um experienced a certain amount of the pervasive culture affected them they have to shed whatever idolatry they have taken on right so they're they're learning that this is not a god right this lamb this goat is not a god you're going to take it you're going to draw it out right you're going you the jewish people have to learn that this is not a god this lamb is not a god take it bring it into your house tie it to your bedpost for four days then you're going to shecht it you're going to kill it and you're going to take the blood we all know this story you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it on the doorpost and you're going to put it on the lintel you're going to put it all around on the inside on the outside you know obviously god knows when he comes down and he's going to kill all the firstborn he knows that this is the jewish home so who's the blood for obviously it's not for god god knows who the jewish people are it's for it's for the jewish people to understand that this lamb this sheep is not a god right we have to dispense with we have to get rid of the idolatry we the jewish people are going to come out and be born as a new nation 
It's an amazing imagery. If you imagine this doorpost, it's daubed with blood, blood from what was, is considered to be the God of the Egyptians. We're taking the blood of this animal and we're putting it on the door frame. And in the morning, we're going to walk through that door frame. We're going to walk through the blood stained doorway and we're going to be born as a new nation. It's really like an image of birth through the blood stained um so to speak, uh, birth canal. And, and when we get to the Red Sea and the Red Sea splits and the Jewish people go through that, like it's the birth canal into the desert. We are, we are literally being born as a nation and we are coming out into the light. We had the locusts that, that made the whole land dark. We had actual darkness, the plague of darkness, you know, however you understand that, but it was darkness such that the Egyptians couldn't see, but the Jews could. And now we have this plague of the, uh, the firstborn, death of the firstborn, at midnight, right? This is at midnight. What's midnight? Midnight is the darkest moment of the day, right? So we have sunset, it gets darker and darker and darker and darker. And then in the middle of the night, it's the darkest. That's the threshold over which then it get, we get lighter and we come up to the dawn and it gets lighter. So this darkness descends and it gets darker and darker and darker. And then at that moment, that, that, that moment of midnight is the darkest moment. And that's when the death of the firstborn happened. It had to happen exactly at midnight because that's the darkest point. And it, as you know, uh, the Jewish way is dark to light, right? Our days start at night, right? So we celebrate Seder night on the night of the of the 14th of Nisan. It's that it's the night we start and we go from night to day. That's how our days go. They go from, from dark to light. We go from, from, from exile to redemption, right? So what we're happening, we go from a dark place to a light place. So, um, so that's, that's something to, to kind of like think about. It's increasing. It's like the middle of the night, this middle of the night moment where there's the darkest moment we've come, we've come from a, um, and that, at that point, what's happening, the, the firstborn of everything, every firstborn in the land of Egypt is, is, is dying. It's apparently, according to the Medrash, they didn't all die right away. Some died over a course of a number of hours or days or whatever, but there was an outcry, like screaming and the existential cries of loss and pain and et cetera, et cetera, going on throughout the whole land. And there was silence, right? So again, I want to I wanna talk about this idea of, of, um, of speech. So there's a mystical idea that says that in Egypt, there was the exile of speech, that speech was exiled, whatever that means. Right? It means that the Jewish people at the beginning were silent. They didn't, they couldn't speak. And then we spoke about how they started to groan, right? They got, they, it, it kind of like hit them that they could, they could bring, they could bring the speech out of exile. God created the world with speech. Then he used the plagues to undo and to show that he's behind everything. And then he comes out and there's the 10 commandments, which is a spoken, the word of spoken word of God. So we have coming out of a place of constriction in Egypt where the Jews were unable to speak, where there wasn't a, an ability to speak. We couldn't put it into words. And then we groaned and then we cried. And what did we do on that first night when we came out of Egypt? We sang praises to God. Now this holiday called Pesach, we say it skipped over, right? Everybody knows that God was skipping over the houses of the Israelites. But another way to understand the word Pesach is Pesach. It's two words. The mouth, Pe, the mouth, Sach, that speaks. Now the Jewish people are learning how to speak. And we're speaking and we're praising God, right? We're saying Hallel. This is what we do on our Seder night. We speak out. You have to speak it out. Even if you're doing the Seder on your own, you have to speak it out because there's something about speech, putting speech into the world, making it actually concrete, concretizing it by speaking it, putting it into sound waves that go out into the universe, that it makes it real. It's not a thought. It's a speech. It has to come out. We have to say things. We have to say things. And it's a night of faith. It's a night of understanding that God's behind everything. And the more we speak about it, the more we internalize that teaching into ourselves. So we talk about, talk, we, we speak about, and it says in the Torah that you teach your children. Yes, we're teaching our children. But in the act of teaching our children or teaching our students or teaching our, um, teaching our family members, whoever, whatever, it's also very important that the education that's going on is for us right so you're only going to be as good as a teacher as how much you've integrated this material into yourself like how much you believe it how much you live it and know it and speak it and have it 
that's as effective as you're going to be. <laughs> so as much as you might want to change other people, really the hardest task is to change ourselves and for us to be able to really like know this and understand this. It takes speaking and speaking and speaking and grappling and trying to understand it and going over it and machinating it. And that, that's why I think one of the reasons why it's given that we have to say it every day. Every day we have to remember we came out of Egypt, we came out of Egypt. But what are we remembering? Not just that, mm, that, that decades ago, thousands of years ago, we came out of Egypt, but we, that's our story. It's our story. We're part of this people, this great, amazing people. We're part of that people. It's our story. We have a role to play in that story. Go back to the puzzle metaphor of we are peace in that puzzle. And that puzzle has gone back to this. This is our, this is our national story. This is who we are. We are descended from these people. This is our story. And this energy of redemption that is now and that's more magnified at the time of the Seder night is available to us now. It didn't happen just then, it's gone. It's cyclical. The timing comes around. When we get to Seder night, there is a redemptive energy in the in our world that we can grab hold of, that we can break free from things that hold us back. We can move into new places. That's what's happening on Seder night. And we need to know that. We need to think about it. We need to talk about it. We need to express it. The more we talk about it, I heard it, I got a quote somewhere about talking about it here. It says, uh, speaking to reaffirm faith, I believe because I spoke. Faith is forgotten if it is detached from their mouths. Faith is forgotten if it is detached from their mouths. So there's a strengthening that comes from the verbalization of these ideas. The more we verbalize them, the more we integrate them into ourselves. So yes, on the on the idea of, you know, speak so your children will know, but speak so you will know. Speak so that it comes part of you. That is what you understand, that what you know. You know, you surround yourselves with people who talk about these things, and it becomes part of your part of your speak, right? If if the Jews stayed in Egypt, we would have lost, we would have been gone, we would have sunk into the into the Egyptian idolatrous practices and nature because that was what surrounded us. So who are we surrounding ourselves with? Are we surrounding with people who are searching, who are growing, who are bringing us out into the light, right? I love that this Torah portion really is about going from darkness to light. It's from going from a place of constriction to a place of amplification and clarity and light and attachment to God and being partners with God. He gives us the mitzvah of time and giving us the, the ability to create time through declaring the moon and the firstborn. The firstborn, like we have in this week's Torah portion also, the idea of how to sanctify the firstborn and how the firstborn of the Jewish people who survived the plague of the firstborn that affected the Egyptians, that they have to be redeemed. So we have the, 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 all the teachings about redeeming the firstborn. Um, so I don't want to go into that. There's too much to talk about right now. But uh, anyway, but so this lamb, we took this lamb into our homes and we attached it to the doorpost. And then after a few days, <laughs> four days, we uh, shechted it, took the blood, put it on the door, and then we roasted the animal. We roasted the animal. We didn't boil it. We roasted it and we ate it. We ate it with our families and with anybody living in our homes. We ate it as a family. Like again, our nation is um, predicated on having families who are strong. Families who can, um, from which we can change the world, right? So yes, we have these individual families, but the families make up the Jewish people, right? So we're all part of a family. We all have, um, we all have parents. <laughs> um, maybe we don't have siblings. Maybe we don't have children. Maybe we don't have aunts and uncles. But we, we, are, whether our families are small or families are large, we are part of a family. Jewish people are a family, but we have our own nuclear families, and this. Korban Pesach, this, uh, Pasch, this Passover sacrifice had to be eaten as a family. And this is part of the transition that the Jewish people are making. We're going from this place of idolatry, this place where we, where we were constrained, and we're going out into the light. And one of the first lessons, as we said, is learning how to be in control of our time. What do we use our time? How do we use our time? You can think about that for our lives. How do we use our time? But also that we are learning right on that night when we're inside our homes and there's a screams going on in the Egyptian homes of all the people dying and all the animals dying and etc etc that what we're doing we're eating together as a family we're strengthening we're sharing we're sharing we're sharing we're being part of a bigger collective it's not just me it's us 
right? We're going to be, we're going to give to other people. We're going to be part of a Jewish people that takes care of each other, looks after each other, makes sure everybody's part of the party, right? So all are hungry, come and eat. By the time you sit at the Seder and you say, let all are hungry, come and eat, a bit late, right? So you've got to think about that beforehand. Invite people, make sure you have people who have nowhere else to go, make sure they have a place to go. And what happens is, Pharaoh's like, get out of here, you've got to get out of here. And there's a medrash that says, and Moses is like, no, we're not going to leave till the morning. We're leaving in the morning, right? But we're eating, we're eating this Paschal lamb. We're eating it with our shoes on, with our belts tied, with our staffs in our hand. We're ready to go. We're going to go out into that desert. We're ready with alacrity and with speed. We're going to take this inspirational moment we're going to take this moment where like like there's screaming but not you know we're good and we're, we're in our homes where we're we're protected by God himself God himself comes down to smite the firstborn of the Egyptians and um and uh we uh and we're ready to go with this alacrity so I want to just the last probably the last point I have time for is the idea that um when there's an inspirational moment, when we have an inspirational moment, like seize it, like go with it, like don't let it pass. Or somehow, I, I like the I, the um, metaphor of lightning. If you're in a dark, like you're walking on the dark, like, I don't know, it's always in a forest. So you're in a dark forest and you don't quite know where you're going and there's a flash of lightning and this flash of lightning lights up the forest and you can see for that moment, you can see the where to go. Right. You know, oh, I have to go that way because that's because I can see I have the clarity of the light shedding through the lightning. I can see where to go. So you start walking and then it gets dark again. But you but you remember what the light showed you. So you keep going. <laughs> so there's another flash of lightning and then you maybe reorient or you're going in the right direction. But it's a it's a great metaphor for our lives. Right. We have these moments of inspiration or of clarity where we like maybe maybe we don't. I don't know. But um, maybe other people do. and We can hang on to them. But, however, maybe, hopefully, we do have moments of inspiration and those are the moments we want to hang on to and those are the moments we want to keep trying to recreate so that we keep reorienting ourselves, you know, like the GPS, you know, the, the spiritual GPS, like, make sure I'm on the right path and I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm on the right path. So the Jewish people left, we, we have this teaching that they left with with alacrity. They left, like, in, in that moment, they had to leave, like, right away before they descended into the deepest darkest places they had to like leave at that moment they had to they had to run they had to go right so sometimes we have to run and go and do and just hold on to that inspiration like do it like just do it because you don't know if it's going to get dark again and then it's a gradual like trying to like w find your way find your way just gradual like those are the moments where it plateaus or it goes down but you know the moments where it goes up like hold on to that and, and remember that and keep that as part of our national narrative which we do the Paschal offering that the Jews ate that night had to be could only be eaten by those who had been circumcised, those who had the Brit Milah. And it says that we were redeemed by our blood, but by, by the two bloods, right? By the blood of the Paschal offering that's on the doorposts and the lintel, and also by the blood of Brit Milah of, of circumcision, that these bloods were were what redeemed us that we this was the first time as a Jewish people that we were actually told to do something this is what you have to do right but up until now the place had just happened right the Jewish people were like enslaved and doing their thing and being enslaved and more and more enslavement and oppression and harshness and then at this at this point with the death of the firstborn the Jews are told to make sure that Brit Mila and and the and the uh, Paschal offering so this blood this idea of being redeemed and these were the two mitzvahs that the Jewish people had to do on that night in order to be redeemed and that the um and that the Brit Mila is something that's done that's done to the individual right it's done eight day old baby it's done it's done on the organ that is the that is the most um um tempted by um you know, it has a, the greatest force to take you into our unholy places right so make sure that it's used for the right in the right way that organ is used in the correct way and um so so the brit mila is an individual is an individual commitment to the jewish people it's a sign that you're part of the jewish people and the korban pesach eating this korban pesach on the night of seder was the communal commitment so we had both, right? So on some level, we also do things communally and we also do things individually. So 
on that night when they rejected the idols and, the, and they were moving away from the idolatry of Egypt and the Egyptians and slaughtering that sheep in front of the Egyptians and taking the blood and putting on the doorposts. They were separating themselves from God and they were, excuse me, separating themselves from the Egyptians, separating themselves from idolatry and, and moving into a place of connection to God and to the divine. And that's the goal. That's our goal. That is our goal. So what do we do on Pesach, on Pesach, on our Passover, on our Passover night? We are commemorating, we are reenacting, we are telling the story and we are part of that story. So it, again, not just something that happened to those people, our ancestors, years and years ago. It's our story. It's part of who we are. We are part of that people. And it's our story too. And uh, psychologically, to be part of a people, to feel that you're part of a people, to feel that you belong, is psych psychologically very healthy. And perhaps it's built into our Jewish practices these healthy aspects of how to live in this world, right? So we want to go from a place of dark. We want to, we don't want to be in the place of darkness, but if we are, we're we're looking for the light. We're searching for that light. The Jewish people, when they were in Egypt and the the plague of darkness, whether it was light that came down or whether it was the the the, the search for light or whether it was real light, whatever it was, the Jews were able to see and the Egyptians were unable to see. And we're looking, we're, we're looking for clarity and we're looking for truth and we're looking for connection to God. They started, this was the beginning of like the Jewish people understanding that God's behind all of this and that he has a, wants a relationship with the Jewish people. And then we go through the uh, night of the death of the firstborn. It happened exactly at midnight, the darkest moment when you think it's all, you know, gone and we have faith that God's with us. He's going to take us out the death of the firstborn all around. We're in our homes with this deity of the of the Egyptians tied to our bedposts. We're slaughtering it. We're roasting it. We're eating it. We're taking the blood and putting it on the door frame. And in the morning, we're coming out through that, through that, you know, birth canal, through the bloodstained doorposts, out into the new, the new reality. We've eaten our Korban Pesach, our um, sacrificial lamb together as a family. We've shared it with each other and we've spoken. We've brought language out of exile. The language that we didn't have when we were silent because we were so oppressed and we started to moan. And by the time we get to the exodus of Egypt, we're singing praises of God. Pesach, the mouth that sings, that we're singing praise to God who's taking us out from this slavery, from this oppression. He's giving us the ability to sanctify time. That's the first mitzvah we get is the ability to sanctify time. And we're going to seize that moment. We're going to spiritually be inspired to seize the moments and to swiftly and enthusiastically move into a new reality. And don't we want to do that all the time? Like keep moving, keep moving, keep finding the inspiration, keep looking for the light, keep looking for connection to God. Uh, be fired up, you know, like that Paschal offering, that Paschal lamb that we ate wasn't boiled and became soft. It was fiery. It was, you know, and on some level, we are fiery people. We want to be fiery people. We don't mean placid people. Here's something really cool that I heard. So as you know, this week's, excuse me, this uh, book of Exodus in Hebrew is Shemot. It's names. And we talked about the, the name of God and our names and how our names are a reflection of our essence. But I heard something else that's really cool. So um, the the sh the shame. Your name is a is a is a, is a shin and a mem. Shem. Shame is your name. So the sh the sh and the m. So sh is like fire. It's all fiery and it's like all passionate and it's all like you know like that kind of imagery of sh like it's a little bit chaotic. And then, mm, you know, um, <laughs> those who do yoga, like, mm, it's like, mm, pla it's like mayim, it's like water, ish mayim, like sh, ma. So it's like going from the fieriness to the, sh, to the, to the, to the peaceful, the tranquility, the, the, the mayim, the water, the, the truth, the, the something that, that you can join that's not so chaotic, that has order to it. So like the Seder night is a, is a, a night of order. We go from, from chaos to order, we go from shin to men, shame is your name, like we, we, we kind of like hold on to our essence and we go from a, a chaotic state to a tranquil state 
uh, sham there, you, you know, over there. When I get to over there, I'm going from sh to mm. shema is also this idea of, of like taking something that's chaos and making it like ordered. And when we come out of Egypt and God says, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do this and you're going to do that. And, gonna, and it's going to happen. And it happened exactly as God said, like, we are ready. We're ready to have that relationship. We're ready to follow God into the desert. We don't know what's going to be. Yes, we have a little bit of food on our back. We have that matzah that we're going to take with us, but we don't know what we're going to eat. We, it doesn't matter because we trust in God. We have faith that God will lead us, that he is in charge. And yes, we're bringing, we're bringing a lot of wealth with us from the Egyptians. Before the plague of the firstborn, we go to the Egyptians and they give us their gold and silver. They, 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 they feel warmly towards us, like, you know, they're giving us their wealth. And at the plague, uh, not really a plague, but when the, um, the Red Sea closes in on the Egyptians, we collect all that wealth. So we're leaving with a lot of wealth, material wealth, but we're also leaving with a lot of spiritual wealth, right? We're beginning the ascent up we're going we're going from passover to the holiday of shavuos we're building our spiritual energy we're building up we're going to we're going to have this relationship with god that we're yearning for that we want we're going to start to see the light more we're going to be given the 10 commandments we're coming out from the 10 plagues to the 10 commandments from before that from the place of 10 utterances that created the world and and we're transitioning along and the jewish people are being brought to be the firstborn nation to God. And who is the firstborn nation? The firstborn nation is like a firstborn child. The firstborn child is the oldest child, has the quote unquote closest, closest to the parents and also closest to the children. What's the role of the firstborn? To take the messages and the lessons of the parents and help to transmit them to the younger children, that poor firstborn child who has that intermediary role on some level to be kind of like the conduit of the parents' teachings to the children. So too, the Jewish people have a, uh, a mandate, a mission to bring the godliness, God's, God's messages, God's teachings into the world to bring to the rest of the children, to the rest of the nations. And the parent doesn't love the firstborn any more than he loves the other children. There's just a different role that the firstborn children have. It's a different role that Jewish people have. And this is our beginning. This is the beginning of the Jewish people being brought out like being li literally a forceps delivery of like a calf out of the womb of the mother cow literally extracting one nation from within the other and it was the 10 plagues that undid undid the the whole the whole order of things showed the jewish people showed the egyptians this is god i am this is god god says i am god is going to bring you out i'm going to i'm going to bring you to the land that's the hope and the faith that they have they follow god into the desert and uh, they, uh, they, they use the um, experiences and the, and the spiritual flash of lightning that happened at, on that night. And they leave with alacrity and with uh, zrizus, with great, um, with great fairy passion um, into the desert. So I think I covered everything I wanted to say, but um, probably not. Um, but uh, but uh, that's what I wanted to say. I want to say that this Torah portion is the beginning of the Jewish people. We're being born on this night, on the night of the Passover. We're, we're told to teach our children, but we're really being told to teach ourselves. We're being we're going from a place of darkness to a place of lightness, to a place of clarity, to a place of truth. When we spoke about the last three plagues in this week's Torah portion, the locusts brought darkness to the to the land. They ate everything. They covered the whole land such like it was like dark. And then we had the plague of darkness, whatever actually that was doesn't matter the Egyptians couldn't see the Jews could what could we see we could see with clarity we can understand we're searching we want to have a relationship with God we're looking God helps us in the ways we want to go we have the death of the firstborn we have Pharaoh searching out for Moses and Aaron looking for them to, 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 to get the Jewish people out we leave in the morning we leave in the light we go from dark to light so may we be blessed with the ability to see with clarity, to have light, to yearn to see more clearly, to yearn to understand more, to, to keep peeling back the layers that keep us in darkness so that we can see more and more and more light and um, that we can, that we can um, understand the relationship, try to understand the relationship that God has with the world, with us, and that uh, he's with us 
Bo, bo, bo el paro, come to paro, come, come into the world, says God, come with me, uh, and together we're going to, uh, we're going to try to rid the world of evil. Pharaoh is the epitome of evil. God says to Moses, come with me, we're going to get rid of the evil. Maybe that's part of our, a uh, part of our mission is to get rid of the evil. So may we be successful in everything that we do.